This message this morning, uh, again, you can imagine coming back to the United States is going to be a harsh message and a strong pointed message. But again, it's a message that I think is is needed for our hour. Again, it's not my own choosing, but it is going to be straight up, and I just want to get that out there. But here's what the Lord spoke to me during our time together in prayer. He said, America the beautiful, America the bastard nation, you sit as a queen, exempt from the pain you've caused the nations, but you're unaware of the canker that has rotten your defenses. You pledge allegiance to a flag deep in, uh, dipped in innocent blood, a flag dedicated to sodomites, murderers, and pagan gods. You evoke my name to bless a land and people who are alienated far from my covenant. You ask for my face to shine upon you in favor as you fornicate and touch the detestable and unclean things. America, you've been lied to by both politician and prophet. Witches and warlocks cast their spells with fortune and fame, and with great greed you pursue this folly. Awaken, sleeping nation. Awaken to the sounds of the hordes of hell. Tremble at the sound of the destroyers who are at the gate, within the camp, and those yet to be spawned within your land. My church has failed you by not warning you of my anger towards sin. My church has failed you by not giving you the remedy through repentance. My church has failed you by being a part, or excuse me, by being just like you, a reprobate people. But my remnant are not so, for they will blow the trumpet and sound the alarm and make ready as I visit this earth suddenly. Heavenly Father, thank you for the stern word, but it's a true word. And I pray today, Father, you'll help me to articulate this message in full by going to the words of life, which is the only words that we will trust and hold true in these coming days. We bless you and thank you for the anointing. Break every chain in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. Very powerful uh, word indeed. I said it's going to be harsh, but uh, sometimes that's what you have to have, amen, is a harsh word, a word to bring us back to reality and to bring us into correction with God. The title of this message is called The Hordes of Hell Are Coming. The Hordes of Hell Are Coming. That's what the Lord spoke to me, and some people will say, no, they're already here. Son, daughter, people, folks, you haven't seen anything yet. Uh, you haven't seen the totality of what's coming to this nation. Uh, you can look around this people planet and look upon the landscapes of failed nations, and you will see what it looks like when a nation is churned into hell. And America is at the very precipice of this. And if you think it's bad now, again, you haven't seen anything yet. Coming back from the socialistic, communistic nation of Cuba, uh, I am very familiar with the bondage and the tyranny and the lack of freedom that is there in that country. And just look over the waters into Haiti and see what's happening there in that nation as well as around the world you could begin to realize that America is not immune to what is coming, even though she thinks she is. The hordes of hell are coming. He took me to Jeremiah chapter 4. Jeremiah chapter 4. I am not familiar when I preached it last. I don't really know. I don't keep score as my critics do. I'm sure somebody will write me and tell me and give me a date. All I know is I asked the Lord, what do you want me to preach on? And he takes me there, and he took me to Jeremiah chapter 4. So let's talk about this today. Let's have a fireside chat. Can we do that? And the fire that I'm talking about is the fire of hell. We're going to sit right by its banks and declare the truth of the Word of God. Jeremiah chapter 4. Now in chapter 3, as I set this up historically, God is dealing with Judah because, again, of their idolatry 
and their rejection of God and the quasi-revival that King Josiah had. It was shallow, just like America, just like American churches today. Most churches are shallow. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. They deny their salvation. They deny how they got here. They deny heaven and and the virgin birth and the blood of the Lamb and the, the power of God Almighty and the creative order of God and, and the creation of male and female. And they've turned their belly into their God and they've made God just like them. And he is not because he is other. Let me try that again. He is holy because he's other. He's, other. he's not the same as you. He's not like your mother. He's not like your father. He is God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. And because he is sovereign, he is a holy God. He's separate unto who he is, unto himself. And we should worship him in fear and adoration and exalt that name, extol that name, and tell him he's awesome because he has the name that's above every single name. And at that name, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess and so I bless that name, and I can't bless that name and cuss man at the same time. Somebody help me. And so there was a false revival that God sent a prophet named Jeremiah to fix, to fix the problem. And the problem was they refused to go deeper into the things of God, and they followed the pattern of Josiah. And so that was chapter 3. And you can read about it. And God dealt with them. And Jeremiah pleaded with them to repent. In fact, chapter 3 is, a, is a, a chapter of repentance. God always calls your sin out, but then he gives you remedy. It's called repentance. And they would not do that. So now we're in chapter 4, verse 1. If, if you will return. Remember this, that the covenant blessings of God always swing open on the hinges of if. Let me try that again. All covenant blessings of God swing open on the hinges of if. If my people, if you obey, if you do this, if, 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 I will bless you. But in America, we demand God because we're a microwave generation, a microwave church. We are a me too generation. We want it now. Give it to me. You owe me. A welfare nation, even in the house of God. And we expect God to do what we want, when we want, and how we want it. This ain't Burger King, baby. You ain't going to have it your way. You're going to have it God's way, Yahweh, and that's all the way it's going to be. But we got it all messed up because our preachers have taught us a slot machine gospel. Come on, somebody. And we've looked at God as the big banker. And if we just put enough in, he's going to give us a withdrawal with some interest. They've taken the message of prosperity, which prosperity was to give you power to obtain the covenant, to establish the covenant. Give me power, give me finances, and I'll preach this gospel to the nations of the earth. Come on, somebody. I'm not going to go to a resort. I'm going to fly over to the resort and go to the slum. Anybody here today? And that why you put money into these big britches preachers, I don't understand. Broad bottom preachers, I don't get it. But you do so they can fly around and they don't have to be with the rest of us demons in the plane. Are you here today? Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Some have no idea what I'm talking about. I want you to know something. In order to save money for the mission trip, we rode with demons in the main cabin. In the economy seat. Are you here today? <laughs> Will you get your vertebrae rearranged? <laughs> Not because you wanted it. Is anybody here? Because <laughs> what's hilarious to me is that plane goes down, everybody's dying. Well, I died in first class. Amen. Hallelujah. At least I wasn't thirsty. No, you probably were the first to die. Because you're going with the pilot. If he's having trouble up front, you're going down. It's called a nosedive. Is anybody here today? At least I got 30 more seconds to holler. Where was I? Chapter 4, verse 1. It's part of the covenant. 
if you will return. And Jeremiah was coming to them saying, look, you're full of idolatry. You're full, full of whoredoms. I'm warning you. I'm here to warn you. I'm here to tell you, oh, it may look beautiful and the sky is blue and the sun is out and you're still getting gas at the gas pump and you're still sliding the ATM and you still can get your happy meal. You're paying more now, but you can still get these things. But he said, I'm telling you, this is what the remedy right here. He said, if thou will return, O Israel, saith the Lord. He's doing a plea bargain with them. Return unto me, and if thou wilt put away thine abominations out of my sight, then thou shalt not remove. He, the, the word there in the trick, King James is a bad translation. It basically means this, you will not go into captivity. He was giving them the act of mercy. He was giving them the remedy. He said, if you would repent, I'll take you from going into captivity, and I will bless you. But America, as Judah did, is refusing the protection of God, the repentance of God, and keeping ourselves out of captivity. Therefore, we are doomed, if you will, for captivity. That's why we are a captive nation. That's why our borders are overflowing like a sewer because the destroyers are in the house and other places, including white, the White House and including the, the politicians. It goes on and on. Don't think I'm one-sided. I put the blame on everybody, especially the house of God. Verse 2, And thou shalt swear the Lord liveth in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness, and the nation shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. In other words, he was giving them conditional prophetic direction. See, prophecy can be conditional. Let me try that again. Prophecy can be conditional. This is the problem with people who prophesy on YouTube and different things. They prophesy in the spirit of absolute, saying, you know, this nation is going to be great again, and this and this and this. Honey, it's conditional. It is conditional. It began in verse 1 with if, which means it's a conditional prophecy. But we don't do that. No, we just take it and say, no, nah, Sister Bucketmouth said, and uh, Sister Broadbottom said, and, and on and on and on. And Well, that feels good. And that bears with my spirit. Your spirit, really? Uh-huh, your spirit. The one you mean, Ichabod? Okay, that spirit, gotcha. I'm bear witness with you. You just want to hear that. Watch verse 3. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, break up your fallow ground. Notice this, I got it highlighted in my notes. Break up your fallow ground. You got to go do it. What does that mean? That's untilled ground. That, that's hard-heartedness in your life and in my life. That's what we're doing from this place right here. We're giving you the tools. We're giving you the directions to go ahead and break up that hard heart. Break up that fallow ground. It also means not only untilled but unproductive ground. You ain't got no productivity in Christ. You ain't got no produce in Christ. It's because you got hard-heartedness in your life. You got sin. You got issues that God wants to break the thing up. Let that word be a hammer to you. Let that word be a chisel to you. Let that word break off some of that nastiness out of your life and let the Spirit of Christ dwell in you richly and royally. Come on, somebody, and you'll become a new person, and the fruit of the Spirit will begin to grow out of that callous, hardened ground of your soul. Uh, instead of hardening your hearts, the Bible declares that in the last days, men will be lovers of themselves. The love of God will grow cold, wax cold. Talking about church folk. There's so many hard-hearted, bitter people out there in the house of God. Bitterness is a cancer. I said bitterness is a cancer. It'll take you out early. It'll destroy you. It'll make you arthritic. It'll make you miserable. It'll make you a crusty, rusty Christian. You better get rid of that stuff. You better say, Lord, take care. Put me on the table. See, that's the thing about it. We don't, we don't want to go to the table. We don't want to go to the John 15 operating table. Cut me, Lord. Cut me open, Jesus. Get it out of me. Uh, see, that's, that's too much. I, I need to go back to the American preaching. Take your breath. Take your time. Don't scare them. Okay. I'm serious. 
I am serious. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. Get away from thorny living. Get away from the things that choke out the word of life, the seeds of life. It amazes me that people can be so long in a church and be so far from revelatory truth. So long in the house of God with splinters in your rear end, but you have no inner fortitude in your core. Man is not stronger than it is today. It's a shame. It's a shame. It's like going to the gym for 30 years and you're still 300 pounds overweight. And I love everybody. Tall, small, wide, and thin. Is anybody here? You know what's the truth? My God, what did you do for 30 years at the gym? Oh, you were at the bar. <laughs> Is anybody here today? Them slushies will put weight on you. I don't care what they tell you. Or whatever you drink. But that's uh, we laugh at that, and that's pretty funny. Oh, wow, well, I can picture that in my mind. Oh, I see that, what you're saying, Pastor. But yet it's the same thing in the house of God. 30 years, 20 years, 25 years, we're no better than we were when we got saved. Just an old thorny thing. You old thorny bush, nobody wants it. That's why nobody sits next to you. <laughs> now, if nobody's sitting next to you now, don't get a, a complex. I'm, that's why people don't want to hang out. You're thorny. Oh. <laughs> Brother and sister porcupine. Are you here? How come nobody ever wants to hug me? Hmm, you wonder? Tired of getting stabbed in the back, amen? You porcupine thing, you. Watch this. I love you. I love you, but you need to break up that fallow ground. I'm going to help you today. I am going to jackhammer this thing. Verse 4, circumcise yourself to the Lord. Notice this. This is personal. Break up your fallow ground. Circumcise yourself to the Lord. That ain't my job to circumcise you. Let me, let me just make that plain and clear. That ain't my job to circumcise your heart. My job is to bring the Word of God in such a two-edged way of a sword that it cuts and heals at the same time. But you got to open up yourself and say, Lord, cut me. Don't make me go rocky on you and cut me mick. But I'm going to tell you, cut me. Lord, here I am. Circumcise this thing. Get this old foreskin off of me. Do you know and realize that foreskin like that causes medical diseases? And that's why it's done. Number one is for covenant because God told them to. It's a sign of covenant for a man, but it's also for health. And don't write me no stupid Nazi whatever letters about it. It's the truth. It's the absolute truth. But we allow our hearts to become all that force can be. We allow it to be covered up with all the diseases and the layers of things in our life. I'm giving you an illustrative sermon for a reason because that's what the way God described it. If it wasn't in there, I wouldn't preach it. He, preached, he wants me to preach it that way because to picture that in your mind, that is exactly a carrier of disease. It's a carrier of uncleanliness. You understand? And that's exactly what our hearts are doing here in America. We have this foreskin that has been diseased. And God's saying, I want you to, in the house of God, get circumcised. I wish I had somebody help me. But we have such a callous heart, we refuse to go under the knife. But it has to be done. You men of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem. He said, get it done. Lest my fury come upon you like fire and burn that none. Everybody say none. Nobody, none can quench it because of the evil of your doing. So he said, I want you, watch this. There's two things he's trying to illustrate to us. Watch, ready? Repentance and holiness. Repentance and holiness, they go together. You cannot have repentance without holiness. And you can't have holiness without repentance. So he's telling them an action thing, a verb, to repent or to break up the fallow ground and to be circumcised and then to do what? Sow seed and to keep it clean. 
In other words, walk in holiness. If you don't, I'm going to burn you up. Come on now. I'm reading what you're reading, and I'm preaching what you're hearing. God said, get this thing right. But see, the problem is we do not preach this in the American church. My job, my job, listen to me. My job is not just to get you to the cross. My job is to teach you how to get nailed to it. Uh, let me let that just sit for a second. My job is not just to get a man or woman to the cross. My job is to teach you how to be nailed to it in discipleship and in holiness. You need to be nailed to the cross. What does that mean? That means you carry that cross. No matter where you go, no matter how tired, no matter how weary you are, if you're nailed to it, you can't let it down. Somebody help me because it's going to go wherever you go. 24, 7, 365. Hey, what's that on your back? It's a cross. I'm nailed to it, honey. That's true discipleship, but not in America. No, see, America, we, we wear our cross around our neck or put it in our pocket, take it out when we're in trouble, look at it, and put it back. No, we need to be nailed to it. And that's what he's telling them. He, see, he's taking them out of that quasi-revival of the shallowness of Josiah, and now he's bringing them into the depth of why he's going to judge them is because they would not go to the depth of repentance and holiness. They only gave lip service. Verse 5, are you still here today? We're talking about the hordes of hell are coming. Declare you in Judah and publish in Jerusalem and say, Blow you the trumpet in the land, cry, gather together and say, assemble yourselves and let us go into the defended cities. I'm going to tell you something right now. I'm going to preach to you the word of the hour. This is the prophetic word of the hour, not from me, but from the body of Christ, from those who are watchmen. It is not about prosperity. It's not even about preparation. As far as buying beans and things of this nature, it is this. Watch this. Listen to this portion of Scripture. Declare you, Judah, publish in Jerusalem and say, blow you the trumpet and land, cry together and say, assemble yourselves and let us go into the fenced city. Number one, get ready. Set up the standard towards Zion. Retire or uh, return, stay not, for I will bring evil from the north and a great destruction. The lion has come up from the thicket, and the destroyer of the Gentiles is where? On his way. The hordes of hell are what? Coming. He has gone forth from his place to, take, uh, to make thy land desolate, and thy city shall lay waste without inhabitant. For this gird you with sackcloth and lament and how. So it's a time of what? It's a time of repentance. It's a time of intercession. It's a time to prepare for the destroyers. Again, it's not for preservation alone, even though that is a part of pre preparing for the final days, that the main thing is the heart. Prepare because it's coming. Do you understand the message? It's coming. That's the prophetic word of this hour. We're going to go further, but it's to prepare for what is coming. There will not be a reprieve. There will not be somebody put in power that's going to change anything. There's not going to be a prayer that's prayed by a certain person that's going to make God decide to change his mind. This is done. It's a done deal. It's over. Forget about it. Prepare yourself to meet your maker. Prepare yourself to see the destruction of the, na of the nation that you live in and the nations of the world and the very fulfillment of the Word of God. If you don't like that message, go find you somebody else. They're out there. There's a whole bunch out there, but go pick one. They're cuter too. Well, thank you, sister. I appreciate that. Verse 8, well, honestly, is a good thing. For this, gird yourself with sackcloth, lament and howl, for the fierce anger of the Lord is, can somebody read the next few words to me? Is not churned back from us. It's not. The hordes of hell are coming. They have an assignment. I said the hordes of hell are coming. They have an assignment. They're not going to be churned back. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that the heart of the king, watch this, I'm going to give you five classes of people, and this is going to fit everybody. For the heart of the king and the priests, and the heart of the princess, and the heart of the priests shall be astonished, and the prophets shall wander. How many? 
Five. Who are they? The kings, the princes, the priests, the prophets, and the people. They're all going to be in shock. They're all going to be dealt with. They're all going to be shaken. And the Bible declares that what? John the Revelator, he saw the, the sea give up the dead, both small and great. Every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess to the glory of God, no matter who you are. And I'm telling you what's coming upon this people planet, that's going to make everybody shake no matter where you are. You will have a Belshazzar moment. You better get ready for it. Click, click, clack, clack. Every joint out of, out of place. Is anybody here? It's going to happen. But see, we live in this isolated immune system mindset that it can't happen to the elite. It's not going to happen to the Hollywood stars. It's not going to happen to the NBA stars. It's not going to happen to this star. It's not going to happen to that person. They're insulated. Honey, the only thing that insulates you is the blood of Jesus. Your money will perish with you. Your gold and silver will be cankerous, and you'll cast it into the street at that appointed day. So don't try to bill me that cell. Don't try to give me that junk. Everybody's going to be dealt this hand. Everybody's going to shake and rattle and roll. I don't like you today, preacher. Well, I love you. Verse 10. And that is the message of the hour. If you got somebody else chirping some type of wizardry to you on YouTube and you're getting that stuff sent to you, subscribed or whatever, uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you something. You're being deceived. It's not because I'm preaching. I'm telling you, this is what prophets are preaching. I'm not a prophet. This is exactly what watchmen and pastors and true people are listening to God. This is what they're saying. It is coming, and nobody escapes it. Nobody. And you can't turn this thing back. I would love for it to be turned back. I have lamented. Uh, Lord, I don't want to preach this. I don't, I don't want this to be for my children and the children's children. Uh, when we were at, in Cuba, we had that beautiful children's ministry time. And uh, we had all those little guys, man. You'll see some of the videos and girls, and they had a choo-choo song. I can't get it out of my head. But anyhow, uh, it, was, it was great. It was so beautiful. And I was like, Lord, I said, these poor children to live in this, this hell hole. And then what's coming down the road, and the Lord spoke, he says, I got them. He said, I got them. He said, I got them. It, it, will be, it will be such an instant. It will be such a moment to be in the presence of the Lord. The Bible declares that their angels always behold God, the face always beholds them. It, 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 it's something we don't understand. But I lamented. I said, Lord, these poor, poor youngins. The Lord said, hey, I got this thing, man. I don't understand God. I don't understand God. I don't understand how it's going to take place. And Jeremiah says they will smash their young ones one, once again, one against another. But it's happened in history, and it's happening now, and it will happen again. But God's got this thing. And my job is to prepare with repentance and holiness. Verse 10. Then said I, O Lord God, surely thou hast greatly deceived this people in Jerusalem, saying, You shall have peace, whereas the sword reaches unto the soul. And at that time it shall be said to his people and to Jerusalem, watch verse, th verse 11, a dry wind of the high places of the wilderness towards the daughter of my people not to fan nor to cleanse. Even a full wind from those places shall come unto me. Now also will I give the sentence against them. In other words, there's a wind that's coming, and people who have no discernment think it's a wind of good change. That's what's happening right now with these, these I, I have to be careful with my words, but these people who are deceived politically. To deceive politically, thinking, oh, this wind, there's a wind of change coming. Oh, there's a wind of change. We're just going to get to November, and the wind's going to blow in change. Oh, and everything's going to be different, and you're prophesying and chirping, chirp, chirp, chirp. All of this tripe. Honey, this wind is not coming for a breeze. This wind is not coming to make you feel good. This wind is to bring in the firestorm that is going to be upon this nation. This thing's going to blow your house down. It's going to huff, it's going to puff, and it's going to blow your little house down. And the three little pigs. Somebody here? 
but we had a misconception. We got people that are deceived in the house of God, thinking the wind of change is coming. It's not the change that you think it is. It's not the change that you can vote in. It's a change of guard. It's a change of timing of seasons where God is going to do what he prophesied and declared and decreed through his prophets and the promises of the coming of the King of kings and Lord of lords. And you can't stop it at the ballot box or the digital machine. You can't stop this. But I can tell you right now, there's a fire coming to this nation that you've never seen before. The hammer and the sickle is coming. The fire will devour this country. And what I'm greatest concern right now is that we're going to have self-inflicted fires in the near coming days by people who are foolishly deceived into thinking that we can churn this thing and override the judgment and verdict of God. You cannot. You might be able to convince a judge you may be able to slip some money in a, uh, an envelope underneath a table to get that judge to change something, but not this judge. You can't pay off Almighty God. The dry wind is coming, a full wind is coming. He said, Behold, verse 13, he shall come up as clouds. Who's he talking about? Nebuchadnezzar. And this chariot shall be as whirlwind, and his horses are swifter than eagles. Woe unto us, for we are spoiled. O Jerusalem, wash thine heart from wickedness, that thou mayest be saved. How long shall thy vain thoughts lodge within thee? For a voice declareth from Dan, or the place of judgment, and publish affliction from the Mount Ephraim. Make you mention to the nations, behold, publish against Jerusalem, that watchers come from a far country. Watchers, spies, they're already here. They're already here. Do you know that one of the most clandestine spy agencies and industries is just 90 miles from our nation called Cuba, who've been in our government for years, whose main job is to report back to Beijing and to Moscow for food, for money, for protection. That's how it works not including all the other agencies that are out there in other nations. I get it. But because we think the Banana Republic doesn't have that ability, we are fooled. It just shows you our ignorance and arrogance. So those watchers are there, come from a far country, give out their voice against the cities of Judah. Right here, X marks the spot. Right here, this is where you get them. At the weakest point. Verse 17. As keepers of a field are they against her round about, because she hath been rebellious. Everybody say rebellious. She's been rebellious against me, saith the Lord. Why is it coming on me, Pastor? Why are we having this? Because we're rebellious. Because we wanna we want children to change gender and pay for it. Have surgical operations like some Frankenstein freak show and all the other stuff that's going on in this nation. Instead of letting our little girls grow up to be who they are and play with dolls and boys play with G.I. Joes or something. Tonka truck. What happened to Tonka? What happened to Tonka? Dirt under your fingernails instead of nail polish on it. Come on, folks. I lighten it up for a lot of reasons, but it's insanity. And God says, look, you, don't, you think I'm just going to ignore that? You think you, you're going to give me this inheritance of this mixed bag of, 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 of just craziness and I'm going to let it go? No. He's going to deal with the keepers of the children. He's going to deal with the keepers of the children. That's us. We've got to keep their innocency. You and I. Watch verse 18. And the way in thy doings have procured. Man, I saw that word. I wanted to jump out of my skin. You've procured these things. You went ahead and bought them. You went ahead and bought them. You went and ordered it. You got on Amazon, and you ordered it. You, got, you ordered yourself a can of whoop butt. That's, come on now. That's what you did. This is what he's saying to him. Thy way and thy doings have procured these things unto thee. This is thy wickedness. Because it is bitter, because it reacheth unto thine heart. In other words, it's gone through the blood system, it's gone through the cell system, and now it's all the way into the heart, and your heart is infected. 
You can't get no deeper than an affected heart. There are certain body parts you can live without, but you sure can't live without your heart. America's living with a with heartless, it's a heartless nation. People killing each other for nothing. Come back home here, and all I read is people getting shot up. Just, just more death. More war rattling. Nothing's changed. For a whole week, I had, I had a blackout. Not only of power, we had a blackout of the news. I didn't know what was going on in the world. Judah kept asking me, Dad, who do you think blew up who? I, was, I don't know. We'll find out when we get home. Because they won't tell you down there the truth. I was telling them stuff that their eyeballs got the biggest saucers, you know, just big old, big old silver dollars because some of the stuff they didn't even know was going on in the world. Watch verse 19. They ain't much different here. We get lies. My bowels, my bowels. Now notice this here. If we turn the corner on this, this is Jeremiah. He says, look, I'm going, to try to, I'm going to try to explain this to you all. I'm going to try to articulate to you the sorrow and the intercessory prayer of my heart. My bowels, my bowels, I'm pained at my very heart. My heart maketh a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace because thou hast heard, O my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. See, this is what we're trying to do from the pulpit here at Ignited and other pulpits around America. It's like fire shut up on our bones. We've heard the sound. We've heard the trumpet, and war is coming. And we got to say something to you. We got to tell you business is not as usual. Business is not as usual. Life is not as normal. Life is not a beach. Life is a you know what, and it's coming to bite you. It's coming to harm you. I said, it's coming to destroy. No, we don't have preachers that won't preach this. They're, they're afraid to sound the alarm. But I have to sound the alarm. Because I promise you, you won't take your bony finger and stick it under my nose and tell me I didn't say so. What if you're wrong, preacher? Then I'll apologize to your bony finger. But I don't go, I'm not going to have to do that. I might bite it. Stick it under my nose. Is anybody here? Tell, tell you where you can itch my nose. Verse 20. Boy, he's honoring. No, I'm just back home. I am just back home. I'm just bottled up. You just wait for the next couple weeks. Verse 20. The destruction upon destruction is cried. This is Jeremiah. He's, he sees it. And when you see it, how can you sit back and be so calm? How? I don't understand. I don't understand. People get on the Internet and they give you updates and, you know, they, 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 they can't, you know, when you're preaching, it's different. I get it. But how do you how are you calm? How are you? Well, I don't want to cause panic. I want panic. <laughs> I want you to panic. Panic in the sense of you doing something by faith and moving in the fear and the sovereignty of an almighty God. If you knew hell and destruction was right around the corner, wouldn't you act different? Well, I just want to live my life. Well, I want to live my life too. But I don't want my life to end in destruction because I was a fool. I, I don't, I don't wanna I don't wanna miss my assignment when I could help somebody in my days of living. Because I was too afraid or I wanted to take care of my own. Are you here? I'm so glad I'm surrounded by people like you, those that are watching that are part of this family. I'm so glad we have people who write us and say, man, preach it. I'm with you, I agree. Than these manby pambies out there that are just so afraid. Yeah, I want panic. I do want panic. I, I want people to, to get up and do something. Get them splinters out of your butt. Is there something wrong with that? Huh? Is there something wrong with that? Coming out of Miami there, well, TSA guy, he got it out of mine pretty good. I was waiting for the proctology report when he finished. Does anybody, y'all, can I? If you ain't traveling in a while, you better tighten up. <laughs> They'll help you. Destruction, that's another story. Destruction upon destruction is cried, for the whole land is spoiled. Suddenly, suddenly, suddenly are my tents spoiled and my curtains in a moment. That's what's coming. That's what's coming, not only nuclear, not only civil war, but just overnight, the, the whole world changes suddenly. Verse 21. 
verse 21, How long shall I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? Talking about war and the enemy coming in. For my people is foolish, Scottish. For they have not known me, they are Scottish children. I love the King James. They're Scottish. Now those who are Scottish by birth, that doesn't mean you. This means that they're ignorant. They have none understanding. They are wise to do evil. In other words, you can't understand the things of God, but you can sure do evil pretty good. Isn't that funny? There's a guy on Instagram goes around giving people hundred dollar bills and then quote scripture. Doesn't do very good. A lot of people can't quote scripture. But if you tell them the name of a certain rap song or country song or rock song or this or that or sports number, they got it right on top of their head. That's yeah, let me move on. To do good, they have no knowledge. In verse 23, I beheld the earth, and lo, I want you to see this as we come to a close here in another hour or two. Verse 23, watch this. You've got to pay attention to this. Behold, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. Now, Jeremiah was not there. So Jeremiah was shown this supernaturally. What was he shown? He was shown Genesis chapter 1. He saw the beginning. Read it with me, because you're going to understand now the depth of what's coming if you listen to me. Behold the earth. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, they had no light. So that had to be in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, to Genesis chapter uh, verse, uh, to verse 3. I beheld the mountains... And lo, they trembled, and the hills moved lightly. That wasn't even created in that particular moment. It was created thereafter. You following me? And I beheld, and lo, there was no man. Man was created after all this, wasn't he? What he is teaching and showing us is the understanding of the original earth, the pre-Adamic earth. The earth that was. I'm not going to go into detail because I'll get a thousand letters over it. You just need to go to stevequill.com or get a hold of Skywatch or spend time with others that have in depth teaching. But I want to show you something in a bullet form of what he's talking about. He's talking about the earth that was. You can go to Second Peter and check that out as well. In other places and understand this. Second Peter three. Watch this. And all the birds of the heaven were fled. They hadn't been created yet, were they? So he's talking about something that was catastrophic that took place. Do you know what that was? That was the fall of Lucifer. That was the original flood, the first flood, that brought the destruction upon that which was pre-Adamic. Then God took out of that void and form, uh, lack of form, and he created the heavens and the earth. Are you listening to me? I'm not trying to go deep theology, but you need to get this. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. So it speaks of a destruction that had taken place before. Why does that matter? Why did God put that right there in Jeremiah 4? It wasn't for theology. It was for understanding. For thus saith the Lord... The whole land shall be desolate. Desolate, what do you mean? Just like that was. So in other words, what I'm going to do to Israel, what I'm going to do to Jerusalem, what I'm going to do to Judah is going to be like it was at the fall of Lucifer. And the destruction will be make the place desolate. But what he said, yet I will not make a full end. In that particular incident in Genesis 1, there was a full end. There was a new heavens and a new earth. There was a creation formed, if you will. But it was not completely destroyed. In other words, what's coming is he's not going to destroy the earth in totality when he comes. This is a parallel to the book of Revelation. This is a mirror to the destruction that will come upon the nations of the earth, but yet God will preserve a remnant, and there will be those that will be here during the millennial reign. What am I trying to paint a picture? I'm trying to paint a picture of what Jeremiah is saying, that what is coming upon them that did in historically factual truth 
is going to happen to us in the coming days that God is going to allow these lands, these nations to become desolate. Look it up. Look at Revelation 6 and other places. He's going to allow that darkness to come. He's going to allow the lands to fill his wrath and his fury. You understand? Why? Because of the rebellion of the pre adamic nature, uh, folks, and also because of the fall of Lucifer, and that equals rebellion. So if you put it into a prophetic nutshell, what he was trying to teach us is, is because of the rebellion of the idolatry of Judah, there will be a parallel destruction to the nations of the world, especially Judah. And it's coming to us. Folks, when I read that and I saw that, I wanted to jump out of my skin because that's exactly where we're headed. That's exactly what's fixing to happen to our nation. Verse 28. For this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens above be black. Again, Revelation 6, 12. Because I have spoken it. Listen to what he said. Because I have spoken it. Not because some preacher on YouTube. Not because I'm standing up here preaching it. Because he's spoken it. I have purposed it and will not repent. Neither will I turn back from it. And you know what? It happened, didn't it? It happened in the beginning. And it happened during the time of Judah, and it's going to happen during the time of our lives. It's going to happen in the days that we're living in. We're living in perilous times. We're living in dangerous times. We're living in times that cannot be churned back. We're living in times that we can't appease God and ask for a reprieve. It's beyond that. We have to ask God for repentance of our own hearts and get our own lives ready and break up that fallow ground and have our hearts circumcised. Is anybody here? I know it's a lot to chew on. You'll be chewing on it for a while. But spend some time and recognize and realize, why would God have Jeremiah put that there? Why would he all of a sudden insert something? Because he was trying to relay to them something they would understand. They knew this. They understood that gap, if you will. They understood that pre-Adamic thing, that uh, existence and world, the original world. They understood that. We're the ones that are too afraid to preach it. We're the ones that muddy the waters, and we make everything look like a Sunday school teaching. Come on, somebody. Rather than to get into deep theology and understanding. And when we do that, we recognize and realize how deep this goes with God, how deep it goes with his anger that he'll put upon the nations of the earth. If he was willing to destroy them in flood and willing to destroy others in fire, do we get a reprieve? Do we get to sit back? No, I'm here to tell you, America, the hordes of hell are coming. And God's going to allow them to come forth. He's going to allow them to come forth and do what they're supposed to do in their assignment. Is anybody still with me? Verse 28, for this shall the earth mourn and the heavens be above be black, because I spoke it. Verse 29, the whole city, how much? That's a lot, ain't it? The whole city shall flee for the noise of the horsemen and the bowmen. They're coming. I said they're coming. In many cases, they're already here. And they shall go into thickets and climb up the rocks. Notice the word there, thickets. Well, I'll just build me a defense. Uh-huh. We're going to build a wall. <laughs> you seen some of them walls where the people crawling under the walls, through the walls, and over the walls? Or half the wall, and then there's a picket fence next to it with a gate that says, Welcome to America. It was funny. When we landed in America, we had to go through the customs, and they had this sign that says, Welcome to America. Then underneath it has, I don't know, like 10 different languages. I think I told Judah, somebody said, They still kept the Russian language up there. I said, I'm surprised somebody didn't take a marker and just cut the, you know, put a line through the Russian welcome. Just welcome. Come on in. Come on in. The water's fine, man. We'll give you cell phone, free food, money, and a place to stay, free housing, education. Man, it's awesome. Oh, you're a veteran? We don't need you. Are you here? Climb up through the thickets. Climb up on the rock. In other words, every defense you have, it will be no defense. That's what we do to our... Our veterans, we need these guys. And they know it, and that's why they're getting rid of them. There's too much to tell you about that. I don't have time for that. 
Every city shall be forsaken, and not a man dwell therein. And when thou art spoiled, everybody underline, and when. And when thou art spoiled, what will thou do? What you going to do? What you going to do, bad boys, when they come after you? What you going to do? Though thou, watch this, because this is America. This is a perfect picture. He said, what you going to do when they come after you? Though thy clothes of thyself with crimson. Come on, ladies. Though thou deckest thy, thee with ornaments of gold. I'm not talking about fake costume gold. Gold. Though thou rentest thy face with painting. In vain thou hast made thyself fair. In other words, you're in the time of trouble. What's the first thing you do? Act like a whore. Male and female. Let's just get that right. Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We got enemies, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to doll ourselves up. We're going to make ourselves look available. We're going to look like a cheap whore. And we're going to try to appease our lovers to come help us. To come on over. We got money. We got this. We got that. We'll give you a good time. All you got to do is provide for us protection. And that's what America does. It sells out our military. We sell out our knowledge and corporations and, and different things that we have going on in technology, and we whore ourselves out. And it's going to get worse in the coming days. We're going to make all kinds of deals with the devil in order for us to find protection. And it ain't going to work. No matter how far you spread the leg, no matter how much you give, no matter how much you lift the skirt, somebody help me. No matter how much Chanel number no. 5 you put on or lipstick or Maybelline or whatever you all wear, men, ladies, <laughs> I don't know what you wear. Whatever you're going to do, you're going to have that foo-foo on. <laughs> Come on, somebody. I don't know if they sell them anymore, that little sponge ball thing. I guess that's more French. <laughs> I grew up on Avon. Is anybody here? Musk. How many of y'all remember Musk? You must go get something else because that Musk ain't working. 30 minutes out in the Florida sun, you smell like a musk. Is anybody here? But we were poor, and we were happy. We didn't kill nobody. Watch this. I'm trying to lighten it up as we land. Thy lover shall despise thee. They shall seek your life. In other words, they ain't going to lag with you. They're not interested in your whoredoms. They're not going back to that room with you. They're going to kill you, take your crimson outfit, and your gold. You're going to be rolled, baby. Not like you want to be rolled. You're going to be rolled. Rolled up in the dirt. See, America doesn't see this. For I've heard a voice, and this goes for the church too, dressing up, trying to please the world, acting like a whore so we can get more money from them. I don't need their money. I said, I don't need their money. All I need is faith in God Almighty. His people are blessed. I said, His people are blessed. If God got, has to make you a multimillionaire, somebody listen to me right now, give you an invention, ideal concept, insight, or find oil in your backyard, he can do it. He can do it. And if he, he, he don't need the Hugh Hefners. He don't, he don't need those people of the world. He don't need the Bill Gates of hell. He don't need those people. He can use you. If you get enough people, critical mass, enough people get together, we can change the world. Jesus showed us that was true. The disciples proved it. The early church did it. For I have heard a voice as a woman in travail. Wait a minute now. I thought she was going to party. And the anguish as her that bringeth forth her first child, the voice of the daughter of Zion that bewelleth herself, that spreadeth her hands, saying, Woe is me now, for my soul is wearied because of murderers. She realized and recognized the hordes of hell were coming, and they weren't coming to party. Those destroyers weren't coming as sailors on a boat onto the seashore of a foreign land 
to get a little rest and reprieve. No, they were there to destroy. And she thought she could use her whoredoms to appease them, just like we do today. And she realized through the pain of childbirth that she dwelt in a land of captivity with murderers and realized the pain and the suffering and the rejection of her lovers. It's a very powerful prophetic parallel and mirror we preach today, but the hordes of hell are coming. You say, Pastor, out of this all, the total sum of it all, what do I do? The first thing you need to do is repent. Break up that fallow ground and go to surgery and get that circumcision done and clean yourself up. Get away from the detestable things. Stop touching the unclean things and ask God to pre- produce in you a new heart. Ask God to produce in you new seed-giving life that will produce an internal harvest. So as I repent, I begin to walk in holiness. And that is the remedy today for the remnant. If you're watching me today and you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and again, this is a heavy message and many of this doesn't make sense to you, just understand this simple message that Jesus died on the cross of Calvary so you can live with him forever. Don't go to hell for anybody. It is that simple. Repent now. Receive him as Lord and Savior. Get into a good place where there's teaching of the Bible, whether it's through YouTube or whether it is in a church somewhere. But get your Bible and learn the Word of God. If you're backslidden, come on, this is the day. Come on, this is the hour. Let's get it right. Let's get back to the house of God. Let's get that circumcision done. Let's go ahead and break up that fallow ground. And if anybody in this place and those that are watching need a touch and a healing power of God to be upon your life, I pronounce it now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And in Jesus' name, be blessed. Father, we love you. We thank you for your amazing grace. Help us to prepare for the hordes of hell that are coming. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, I love you. I'll see you Wednesday. We have a time in the Lord. Be blessed.